Uh, so next up, we invite Nico Burns. Nico is a serial maintainer. From what I've heard, they are uh, still on the run. Uh, they are the maintainer of Blessed RS, of Taffy, and uh, more interestingly, or uh, of Servo and Blitz. And today they're going to give uh, this presentation about Blitz. So please welcome on stage Nico Burns. <laughs> Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Nico. Um, yeah, I've been doing some work on, on, on Servo recently, but today I am here to talk about and to some extent announce to the world uh, Blitz, uh, which is a new uh, web renderer. Uh, I've purposely not called it a web engine um, for reasons that we'll come to in a minute, uh, but yes. Um, and Blitz is a project of Deoxys Labs who are funding the work on this. Um, so I just thought I would call them out because uh, it's good that there's funding. I <laughs> um, uh, yes, and on that topic, just uh, as a bit of context, um, I'm going to talk about Blitz in a minute. But Dioxus is uh, Dioxus Labs' kind of primary, uh, I guess you'd call it a product or a project. Uh, it's an open source project, and it is effectively like React or Vue or Angular or some web framework. Uh, but in Rust. Um, and similar to React, like it has a DOM implementation, but in theory it could be agnostic and you can have, you know, React has React Native and it has React SVG and it has React PDF. Um, so it is a kind of generic state and uh, like management library in that sense. Um, it mostly renders to WASM, you can compile it to WebAssembly, you can actually get it to render a website in an, uh, a regular browser. Um, and But it doesn't have something like React Native to render natively. Um, and that's just a screenshot kind of showing the sort of code you might write, um, just to give you an idea. And it looks kind of like, maybe not quite like React, but like Svelte or whatever. Um, OK, now Blitz is... Uh, it's an HTML and CSS renderer. <coughs> um, so it's basically a web view or a web engine, <coughs> but it does not have a JavaScript engine. Um, and the idea is that you can combine it with Dioxus or some other scripting engine in Rust, and then you can just completely bypass JavaScript, which is obviously more efficient, um, saves on binary size, etc. <coughs> um, so this is targeting the kind of the application UI space, so kind of like Electron. Uh, primarily, it could potentially be used to build a full browser, but that's not really the use case. I think uh, if you want a browser, you just use Servo, um, uh, which will share some of the components. Um, and some other similar projects. Um, so Skyter is this like UI library that's used by a lot of antivirus software for some reason, um, and is a similar kind of take on being a web-based UI framework that kind of renders r vaguely standard web stuff. Um, Ultralight is like, I think, WebKit based, and it's for rendering uh, UIs in game engines. Uh, and, and there's some other ones as well. Um, we're building on a lot of servo components, um, particularly Stylo, the Stylo style system, um, which obviously is used in Gecko as well, um, and also a bunch of components that are from the kind of general Rust UI ecosystem. So we're trying to kind of combine different libraries that are out there rather than making everything proprietary to our kind of own thing. Um, and we're also building some bits ourselves. Um, uh, and the idea is that it's going to be kind of really modular. And Servo builds itself as being modular, and it is, but also like. You build Servo, it's a great big thing. You can't, you know, you can't cut out the video playback, for example, or you can't, um, you have to, you, you can embed it like you can embed Chromium, but you can't pick bits of it. And we really want to push on that. Um, partly because, like, a bit about what Steph was talking about earlier, like, I think if the code is usable individually, can be documented individually, then it can be a bit more sustainable, and you can get different parties that have different use cases investing it, rather than it just being just for the browser, 
and if the browser's funding gets dropped, then it doesn't isn't going to get developed anymore. Um, so our architecture is like this. Um, at the bottom, we have the core. Um, and I realized that a lot of these words might not mean anything to you. So Stylo is the style system. It does CSS parsing, and it does selector resolution, and it does resolving of computed and used styles. Um, Taffy does layout. It does flexbox and does CSS. It kind of does box-level layout. It's not going to do text-level or inline layout, which is what Parly does. Um, it's doing rich text and also like inline block and things like that. Um, Access Kit is an abstraction across the uh, different platform accessibility APIs. Um, and then we have some image processing libraries as well. Um, and that is our core. And you'll notice what is not there is any kind of rendering to screen. There's no painting. Um, so our idea is that you ought to be able to use this engine and bring your own renderer if you want to. Um, if you want to render on, for example, an embedded platform, or you want to, if you are someone that already has a renderer and you just want to build web content in, um, then you can just use that bit. We also have um, a renderer that we, we have implemented, which is using Velo, uh, which is a library on top of uh, WGPU. Uh, and that, that blue, the darker blue there is trying to indicate that's the one that exists. And then these other ones are things that could be built that do not currently exist. So in theory, you know, you could have a web render backend or a skier one, etc. cetera. Um, but those things don't currently exist. Uh, and then at the top level, we have kind of two kind of uh, entry points into the system, if that makes sense. Uh, so one of which is integrated with Dioxus. Um, so it will, you know, the event system then is directly the, the event system in your kind of React-like library. Um, and you don't have to go via a JavaScript player or via any kind of abstraction, really. It just plugs straight in. Uh, and the other of which is a kind of an HTML engine. And I put Markdown on there as well, because obviously you can quite trivially compile Markdown to HTML. Um, and we think there's a use case for this in being like a lightweight preview for HTML files or Markdown files. Um, yeah, I mentioned this to some extent already, um, but we kind of have a philosophy of really prioritizing modularity and extensibility and hackability over perhaps being like a completely correct implementation or the fastest implementation. Um, we hope we'll get there, but that's not our priority. Our priority is to be a maintainable solution, a reusable solution. Um, and to interoperate with different parts of the Rust UI ecosystem so that we can hopefully get lots of different stakeholders reusing the same piece of code. Um, so we are trying to use different components from across the ecosystem. So we're using Stylo and the HTML5 Ever parser from Servo. We're using Velo and Parly from Line Vendor Organization. Um, and various other bits and pieces. And then we're also trying to make the code that we are writing ourselves, um, one of the main bits of which is the layout engine, um, available to use even if you don't want to use our engine. Um, which I think is quite, and I mean, I may be corrected here because there's a lot of experts in the room. But my understanding is you can't do that with, say, the WebKit layout engine. You can get the whole of WebCore, but there's quite a lot to that. You can't just pull out the Flexbox implementation or uh, the selector parsing implementation. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, so we want you to be able to turn off bits of our system. So if you want to ship an app, then you don't have to, and you are not rendering SVGs, then you don't have to ship all the SVG code or the video rendering code, etc. But we also want you to be able to add bits that are not part of our base code base. Um, so for example, uh, web engines have you know, special bits that you can't create in HTML, for example, form controls or video controls. Um, and we're hoping, we haven't got this implemented yet, but we're hoping to 
provide an extension kind of API that allows you to do custom shaders to draw or add custom layout algorithms that are not part of standard CSS, um, which we think will be useful for experimentation, but also, you know, if you're shipping an app and you're not trying to deploy it to the web, then you can, you can ship this and you don't need to ask permission from anyone else or get it into the standard. Um, so, yeah, I talked about binary size. Um, it is quite different to Servo, um, and I believe other web engines are kind of, most of them are around this kind of 100 megabyte mark. Um, you maybe get it smaller if you do custom builds of things, but it's not very easy. Um, and so, yeah, we're quite a bit smaller. Um, we ha we're also not feature complete yet, so I would expect that 12 megabytes to go up a little bit, but I suspect it will, you know, it's gonna be more like 15, 20, it's not gonna be 100. Um, and I also just included this screenshot, which is from Cargo Bloat, uh, which is kind of an analysis of, of Rust binaries to go, what is actually causing this binary size? Um, now, ignore the absolute numbers because it is not accurate, um, which you can tell because if you add up the numbers, they do not add up to the size of the binary. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if you, you know, they were analyzed using the same method, so hopefully the, they are kind of proportionally comparable. Um, and I just wanted to point out just how much of the binary size in Servo is, is the script and OzJS crates. Um, it's by far the biggest thing. Uh, Web render is also kind of big. Um, but if you look, the biggest thing in Blitz is the stylo style crate um, by some way, and that's kind of way down the list uh, on the binary size. So I think there's quite you know a lot of benefit to this cutting out the, the scripting engine, basically. Um, and of course, all the DOM APIs that go with that. Um, yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah. Sorry, I forgot. Um, so I'm just going to go through kind of some of the libraries that we're using because people may not be familiar with them. Um, so we're using Stylo from Servo Gecko, which kind of quite incredible in what it provides with like a nice API that you can use independently of these browsers. You get CSS parsing, you get selector resolution, you get uh, things like calc computation, it resolves all of the like relative properties, everything, and it will do it on your own tree implementation, which is fantastic. Um, it's really fast, it's multi-threaded, it's reliable, um, we've had some problems, but I think they're our own. <laughs> Uh, which relates to this other point, which is that it's not very well documented. Um, there's lots of methods in traits that I know we need to implement, but I do not know how to implement. I haven't worked it out yet. Um, so one of the things that we're hoping to do as part of this project is to kind of improve the documentation, to get a regular release schedule out, to do kind of open source hygiene things. Um, and hopefully that will you know, enable more people to take advantage of this great library. Um, and the other problem we've had is that uh, if Servo doesn't support the feature, uh, like, for example, CSS Grid, Servo doesn't have a CSS Grid implementation, then the passing of that, those styles is disabled in the kind of available Servo build of Stylo, um, which means we can't access them either. So we need to kind of come up with something for that. Um, but we're in talks to kind of sort that out and to know, produce a build that does everything. Um, for rendering, we have uh, this Velo library, um, which is, it's a 2D renderer. It's quite an innovative one. It is on top of WGPU, so it's kind of using Vulkan and Metal and DirectX 12 rather than like OpenGL. Um, and it's not only using those libraries, it's using compute shaders rather than the regular graphics pipeline, um, which enables with some very complex math, which goes well over my head, even though I studied maths at university. Um, very fast rasterization of vector graphics. Um, so I have a little video here, uh, which yeah, is working excellent. So this might not look very impressive, but what this is actually doing is it is rendering the glyphs of these fonts at a different, oh, it's the video stopped because it's just a short video. <laughs> 
um, at a different size uh, at 120 frames per second, um, which is better performance than you'll get. And maybe you could do it with this small number of glyphs with an existing renderer. Um, but basically, you can get much better performance. Um, but we are kind of hedging our bets with the renderers because it's while it's quite like impressive, it's also quite immature. Um, uh, but yeah, but we, I guess, are, this is an example of us trying to take advantage of something that's out there that's doing something cool rather than, you know, building our own. Um, I'm doing time. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about what we're doing for text um, because I think this is quite different to what a lot of engines do. We have a pure Rust stack, uh, which is not using any of the system text APIs at all, uh, apart from on some platforms, it's using it to enumerate fonts. Um, so Screefer is um, being funded by the Chromium team, and it does font parsing and also hinting and scaling um, for kind of glyph rasterization. Uh, these other libraries, Fontique and Swash and Parly, are open source libraries as part of the uh, line vendor project. Fontique does font enumeration and fallback. Uh, Swash does uh, shaping and kind of miscellaneous analysis of Unicode text. Uh, and there is also Rusty Buzz, which is basically just a Rust port of Half Buzz, which we might be using for that. And then Parly is, in my opinion, the most interesting one, which does uh, the text layout. Um, and to which I have recently been working on adding the inline block, uh, hence those black rectangles that are not very pretty. Um, but obviously, if you are actually rendering, you can render those how you like, but it's the fact that it's computed the positions which is useful. Um, so yes, I think the idea is to create a standalone library that will do all of the hard parts of text, basically. Uh, including the shaping and the layout and the rendering um, that you can plug into anything that you want to. Um, and currently it is, you know, it's not going to have the full web feature set, um, but I think the idea is that it could. Um, and it's worth mentioning that this is kind of different to what Servo does. Um, it has its own layout engine, and I think we are open to kind of merging projects uh, in some way. Um, but a key thing for us is that the layout engine is usable independently. Um, so we're kind of only going to do that if we can work out a way to extract the layout from Servo into an independently usable library. Um, ah yes, and I should just mention that we've put a bunch of work into the library. We haven't actually integrated the library. So currently, uh, this over here is what uh, a website with text looks like in our engine. Uh, and th this is actual servo. Uh, so not good. Um, and you can see that we uh, don't have font fallback, hence a bunch of missing characters. And we also don't have any line wrapping whatsoever. Um, <laughs> but we have the library there that will do that, that we just haven't plugged in yet. Um, so for the box level layer, uh, we're using a library called Taffy, um, which is one of the things that I've personally worked on the most. Um, it has a very good Flexbox and CSS grid implementation, um, where very good is uh, at least as good as React Native, I would say. And we have a thousand tests that show it's the same as Chrome, but a thousand is not WPT's complete test suite. Um, and we currently have a bit of a problem with running the WPT test suite because it assumes that you have a whole browser with a scripting engine. Um, so there's a few ways which we can solve that, one of which would just be to add a scripting engine specifically for running the tests. Um, I'm not particularly keen on doing that. <laughs> um, I'm hoping that we can, for specifically layout tests, come to some kind of format for the tests that doesn't require script. Um, I don't know if there's anyone in the room that does WPT tests, but if you are and you know how I can make this happen, then let me know. <laughs> um, and I also 
um, have some contact with uh, the people who do the yoga library that powers React Native, and I think they would also be interested in this because they they currently use the same test suite that we do, but would like to have full kind of web compatibility. Um, and yeah, I should just mention that we the approach we're taking with this is kind of similar to the Ladybird web browser. We're like really trying to follow the spec in the structure of our code, um, which I would totally recommend to everyone because it's it makes it so easy to fix the bugs. You know, you still have to work out what, what it is that you've missed, but once you do, it, it works and it seems to pass all the tests, which is great. Um, and I guess I'd also say currently this is it's not production grade from you know a tier one browser point of view, but I would like to make it so, and I don't see any reason why it couldn't become so. Um, and I think there is the kind of potential in a kind of neat, well-maintained code base to really push what layout can do and like parallelize it. Um, so if anyone is interested in kind of growing this project, then yeah, come and join. Um, but yeah, just to kind of, I guess, illustrate where we are, this is Servo's three layout modes that it has. <laughs> so on the left, we have, uh, I believe, Layout 2020 with Flexbox enabled. I think in the middle we have Layout 2020 with no Flexbox enabled. And here we have Layout 2013, which actually, for this particular page, which is obviously the Google home page, is seems to be the best, um, which I think is interesting, but hopefully that will get fixed at some point. Um, and then this is Chrome uh, on the right and Blitz on the left. Um, so, I mean, you saw the screenshot earlier where you know, our rendering was terrible with the text stuff because we've not really worked on that tool yet. But for the Flexbox and Grid stuff, we are pretty good. Um, yeah. And hopefully, we we'll, can push some of that into the Servo project as well. Um, yeah. If anyone is interested in, in kind of working with us, then, then let me know. Um, and then, yeah. So I guess in terms of what we're planning to work on going forwards. Um, getting the text stuff in is top priority. I'm actually really hoping to get that done for today for this demo, but <laughs> didn't happen. So uh, I thought I would be honest and put the terrible screenshot in instead. Um, getting all the font loading working, both the system fonts and the web fonts. Um, we currently don't have any kind of interactivity. Like you cannot click this. Uh, so that is quite a high priority, and that brings with it quite a lot of complexity just in terms of dealing with updates to the DOM. Uh, currently, we run it once and then it's done. Um, so I think that will require quite a lot of attention to make sure that it's working reliably. Um, we want SVG support, which I'd be quite interested to see the talk later, actually, because one of the interesting things about using Velo as the renderer is it has very good vector graphics support, so we should be able to just plug that straight in. Uh, there's a bunch of CSS features we don't quite support. Um, and then, yeah, I think a big one will be allowing people to build custom widgets, um, which we can use ourselves to implement things like form controls. Um, but we really want that to be almost like a proper UI toolkit rather than just kind of an internal one. Um, and we're looking at some of the options in the, the Rust UI space to just plug in. Um, so yeah, that's it. There's um, some links here. I don't know if those will be, I guess the slides will go around at some point. Um, if you're interested in getting in touch, then do it. And uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, then please ask. <laughs> so folks, questions? Who's first? Sorry, I wasn't listening as carefully as I should have <laughs> to the part where you s were talking about WPT and what you yes. couldn't do in WPT and about lack of scripting. If you could explain that a little yeah. bit more. Yeah, so I mean, the problem we have currently is that we cannot run the WPT at all because we do not have a JavaScript engine. So <laughs> it's when you say lack of, s I sorry, I, I misread that as lack of scripting support somehow in WPT, but it's the other way around. Uh, it's not it's not a deficiency in WPT itself that we could fix in WPT. It's from the other other side. Well, I mean, 
in some way it's like in some ways it's WPT being too featureful in that a lot of the layout tests which shouldn't really require scripting happen to use scripting to for example generate uh, DOM nodes to test the layout of and then to kind of assert uh, like whether the layout is correct and, and not all of the tests do that um, so some of them are just plain HTML and there's like a reference HTML right. that you compare right so um, ms2gr mentioned that on on the um, matrix channel that we do have the ref test mechanism at mm -hmm. least which shouldn't doesn't itself require scripting you can write a ref no, test so the, the ref test kind of works for us um, when I was just working on the Taffy library that was also difficult because we didn't have a renderer either <laughs> Um, and I do think that a new kind of test that just like compares actual like integer or float values for the dimensions of boxes would be good, partly because it's actually more accurate than a visual ref test, because there's multiple different ways in which you might produce the same visual result. Um, but yeah, what I would also ideally like is just to kind of almost ban scripts in layout, ref layout tests um, and, you know, maybe turn it into a build script or there's some other way to do that. Um, whether people can be convinced to accept that, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, I know that sometimes in ref tests, uh, script is used in order to test invalidation. Uh, like mm -hmm. maybe you have some initial state and then you change it with script and then you do, uh, you, uh, you have uh, a class th uh, that you uh, like to make sure that the that after you change that, the that's when the snapshot gets taken, uh, and so uh, I wonder how Blitz does with like invalidation and those yeah, kinds of things. So I, I wonder. Uh, I assume you like how much do you optimize things and do you run into invalidation issues? So, so like in Taffy, which is the layout library, um, we have had bugs from invalidation um, and. We've kind of written manual unit tests for those is currently our solution. Um, I can definitely see why you would want to use script in that case. Um, I think my kind of short term suggestion would be if that's the case, great, keep the script, like that's fine. But if it's just a case of you can't be bothered to write out all the test cases, then that seems like it could be dealt with, you know, some other way. Thank you. Uh, next question. Behind you. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, hi. I was curious how you balance the, the complexity of allowing sort of maximum mod modularity with sort of like the combinatorial explosion that comes with that. So like both in terms of testing and also managing the complexity throughout the code base. Well, I mean, it does induce introduce complexity and it certainly it makes you think about your code a bit more because you have to uh, define, it doesn't necessarily have to be a stable interface, but it needs to be a, a kind of a clean interface with a boundary. Um, uh, I think, I don't know, I found that it, it makes each individual bit much easier to understand. Um, and I mean, I've been working yeah, primarily with the layout and layout doesn't interact with an awful lot. like. There's there is a reasonable amount of API surface, and it's almost entirely just a great big struct of styles. Um, there's a lot of like styles having to go in, but otherwise it's just like a tree structure. Um, and a lot of uh, the servo libraries also do this, where they basically make you implement a trait that kind of walks through the tree. Um, and and we've done the same. Um, and and then you know you're outputting a size, which is not you know that complicated. I do think there are areas where it would be more difficult, um, and especially, you know, we're cut out, we've cut out the scripting engine, and that's where, you know, I look at server and I'm like, how would you disentangle that? I think that would be very difficult. Um, I would be interested to see someone put a scripting engine on top of Blitz, because it could be done. I don't know whether it could be done performantly or not. Um, but, yeah, interesting. All right. The next question. Right. Thank you, Nico.